why Russia, China, North Korea, and Ireland teaming up? Because uh, they're, they're neighbors? Cap, cap, cap. This missile struck Kharkiv, Ukraine on January 2nd, 2024. And immediately, something seemed off. It didn't look Russian. It was one of hundreds Russia fired over a five-day span in its largest air attack since invading. But when experts in the U.S. government took a closer look, they found it eerily matched photos of missiles made in North Korea. Russia had also fired dozens of these drones, which are made in Iran. And cruise missiles like these with wiring and turbojet engines from China. Okay. The appearance of these weapons in Ukraine isn't an accident. They are a key way these four countries are working together. And they're growing close enough that some in the U.S. are beginning to call them an Axis. That's Axis like the Axis powers, who fought the U.S. and its allies in the Second World War. And the Axis of Evil, that U.S. President George W. Bush, well, made up. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an Axis of Evil arming to threaten the peace of the world. But I've been seeing this new axis described in a lot of different ways. There's the new axis of evil, the axis of rogues, of evasion, even of outcasts. I think the name that best describes this groups of countries is the U axis K of upheaval. S. It's the big geopolitical shift that we've seen over the last several years. So why is an autocratic mafia state, an Islamic theocracy, a communist superpower, and a reclusive socialist state teaming up? And how much danger do they pose to the rest of the world? Governments of China, Iran, Russia, and North Korea are very different states, but they do have a couple things in common. First, they're all trying to build their own spheres of influence. When Russia was part of the Soviet Union, it controlled much of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, largely thanks to its vast wealth, energy, technology, large military, nuclear weapons, and seat on the powerful UN Security Council. But after the Soviet Union fell, many of these countries left that sphere by joining the NATO alliance and European Union. Ever since Vladimir Putin took power, he's been destabilizing and even invading countries who are considering doing the same. Iran's Islamic regime, meanwhile, has wanted to become the most powerful in the Middle East ever since it rose to power in 1979. It used oil wealth to fund militias and amass thousands of missiles and drones in order to influence and threaten its neighbors. North Korea's first leader rose to power in the 1950s after a war split the ja, Korean Peninsula. Ja, so why don't they make a global NATO and everybody joins and nobody can invade anybody? A global stalemate. And since then, he, his son, and now his grandson have built a massive military and nuclear USA weapons arsenal that talk. they threatened to use to conquer South Korea. Oh, the UN! Oh, the UN! Dude, that's a desert, dude. So whenever you start doing some shit and bombing a country, they do. Don't do that, man. Don't do that, meanie. Finally, the what? Chinese Communist Party has been vowing to take over Taiwan since it rose to power in the 1940s. It built itself into a superpower with vast wealth, a large military, nuclear weapons, and a seat on the UN Security Council. But it's expanded its ambitions to wield influence across all of Southeastern Asia. <laughs> The second thing these four have in common is that the U.S. has been thwarting their plans. It's been arming its allies to block these countries from expanding their influence, and they all hate it. In many ways, the most powerful glue between those two countries is their shared animosity of the United States. Andrea Kendall Taylor what? is an expert on this new axis. Despite sharing an enemy, these four states weren't really all that close until the last decade or so, really? when the U.S. began unleashing a powerful economic weapon. Oh, because they've probably seen bits and pieces of together. this story over the last couple of years. I've been following it for about a year now, and it's been made a lot easier thanks to my Ground News subscription. And I'm also super proud to have them on as a sponsor reporting on this Ground News. In the last few decades, the U.S. has been increasingly placing what's called sanctions on its enemies. 
Sanctions are a tool that the United States regularly wields to push back against actions that other countries take, but that obviously fall well short of military measures. Sanctions weaken America's enemies by basically blocking trade to that country until it stops doing what the U.S. doesn't like. Sometimes the U.S. alone refuses to trade with the country, but it often gets its allies or even the whole U.N. to also agree to stop trading with it. And that can prevent a country from getting things it really needs. To punish North Korea for its nuclear program, the UN has placed sanctions that have led to severe shortages of energy, technology. Bro, North Korea is already like running out of shit. They, they, the population doesn't, don't have a lot of food, water, power, brother. And they're still making a bunch of bombs and shit like that. Like, how the fuck? Energy and food. This shit doesn't work to for deadly fuck all. And crippling its economy. Sanctions on Iran have blocked it from selling its oil, leaving it short of cash, while also preventing it from getting the advanced weaponry it needs to match its rivals in the Middle East. Sanctions are one of the key reasons why these states began to work together. Since the 1980s, Iran's been buying missiles from North Korea, and in the last decade, North Korea has been buying Iranian oil. China's also been buying Iranian oil and trading with North Korea, which it views as a Ch am, I, but am I wrong, China, when they put sanctions? It's only the population that tanks. I feel like the, the rest of the garbage still stands pretty intact. It's just, it's just, it's just the population that tanks. Ally. Your, your daily person but suffers but Ukraine, uh, uh, above that. It took their cooperation to a whole new level. Key news, Ukraine under attack. And Ukraine woke to explosions around the capital, Kiev. Two years since the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, ordered his troops to invade Ukraine. The, the Ukrainian losses in comparison to their population are pretty significant. Putin is finished. He's doubled down on everything. The sky is Taiwan's losing. One. Russia, I think, is literally running out of country. ammunition. They're seeking Taiwan. some support and some ammunition. Russia has used up huge amounts of ammunition, weapons, and equipment in Ukraine. And sanctions placed by the U.S. and its allies have made it difficult for it to replace them. Additionally, many Western countries have stopped buying Russia's oil. Yeah, but hold on, hold on, chat. Guys, guys, if these are friendly with the, with the Iran and whatever, and these guys don't have a lot of oil, and these guys sell oil, get money, make the things, and sell it back to Russia, it just, it just changes the infrastructure of the trade but it's, it still remains in, pretty much intact. What? Still leaving it also short of cash. Suddenly Russia needs a lot of help, but very few countries are willing to give it any, except for three. And it just so happens that Iran, North Korea, and China all have something it desperately needs. That's why I made these cards. Hopefully they're an interesting way to show you what each country has to offer, because at the very heart of this new axis are transactions. Russia convinced North Korea to begin sending it millions of rounds of ammunition and missiles. It also got Iran to send it missiles, plus thousands of drones. Russia had to turn to these countries out of necessity. It is very consequential and important what Russia is getting, but just as important is what Russia is having to give away in return. Russia has become Iran's largest source of foreign investment, and it's now sending Iran very advanced weaponry, like fighter jets and attack helicopters. Russia is also sending more food and energy to North Korea, plus advanced technology that it can use in its weapons. But neither state has helped Russia as much as China has. It's been buying lots of Russian oil, China, injecting... But how do they maintain such... Because the technology is impressive, sure, cool. I think maintain it is the, is the hardest part, no? Maintain it, maintaining it, servicing it, storing it, all that. I mean, this becomes almost obsolete very quickly if, you, if they can't do it properly, no? Billions of dollars into Russia's coffers. And it's sending Russia what's called dual-use products. Those are things that can be used for both commercial or military products. So while it's not accurate to say China is sending Russia well, weapons, of deal. many of these dual-use products are ending up in Russian weapons, like navigation equipment, jamming technology, jet fighter parts, and even drone parts. Mm. In exchange, Russia has been sending China more sophisticated technology, possibly for things like submarines and missile defense systems. By fulfilling each other's needs, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are able to survive despite being sanctioned. And all four are improving their ability really to carve out spheres don't. of influence. A win-win-win-win. Iranian drones and North Korean ammunition have helped Russia bog down Just Ukraine's so counteroffenses, while Russian weapons have bolstered Iran's defenses. And its technology is believed to have helped North Korea build more advanced ICBM missiles. But while Russian technology and Iranian oil does help China, it's not involved in this axis to make trades. There's yeah. certainly That's what I was saying. kind of tangible things that China is getting, but more than anything else, I think it is China wants to build a world that it thinks is more favorable 
to China, and in that pursuit, okay, that makes a lot more Russia sense. is an extremely useful partner. As China strives to become more powerful, the U.S. is using its vast system of allies to contain it. So backing these states is a way for China to distract and threaten the U.S. in more places. And it's even using its seat on the Security Council to yeah, thwart the a lot more sense. agenda. It recently teamed up with Russia to block new sanctions on North Korea and block the U.S.'s call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Could this axis survive without China? I think it would just be far less impactful. Um, it's the resources, really, that China brings to this that makes this axis of upheaval so concerning. The concern is that China could use this axis to undermine the entire U.S.-led world order. Hence, the axis of upheaval. But when you think about what upheaval is... So doesn't China have like a really massive like means of production, Chet? Like, um, like the factories and they can actually fucking get, make shit. ...led world order. Hence, the, the axis of upheaval. But when you think about though. what upheaval is, it really is acts designed to overturn an existing order. And I think that's precisely what these four countries are trying to do. They're trying to overturn the rules, the norms, the institutions that have underpinned the world that we live in today. China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea feel that those rules are being used to weaken them. So by teaming up, they could begin to build a new system based on how they want to rule. They have that idea that there is no universal definition of democracy or human rights. Chat, guys, what about like Japan and South Korea and all the mother suckers that are on the islands right there? Like, you mother, these mother suckers, I feel like if something was to go wrong, I mean, I mean, they, they will suffer pretty quickly, no? Because like, if, if there's like a, a problems in this blue thing or whatever, right? I mean, these are, are weakened because they're right there. Idea that there is no universal definition like Hong of Kong. democracy or human rights, or the idea that no out, outside state should have the right to interfere in the internal affairs of another state. Basically, code for the United States can't push democracy on human rights in other countries because that's undermining to other autocracies. The risk for the U.S. is that they might convince other autocracies who agree to join their axis, perhaps even some states that are more neutral, creating a group large enough to compete with the U.S. Oh, Hong Kong is China. Oh my God, I said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Andrea believes that competition is already beginning to spark violence. We had a flare up in uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, Venezuela has threatened to take parts of Guyana by force. And certainly we have the conflict in the Middle East. And I worry very much that it is in large part because we are moving towards this world where it's not just the U.S.-led order, but these two competing orders. For now, this axis is far from being an alternative. What order. I had meant is Taiwan. Taiwan has um, some of the some of the some of the stuff like um, like 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 some of the microchips. Order factories. Or, or is that Hong Kong still? That's its Taiwan. leaders have been meeting each other more frequently and signing agreements, but they're not promising to defend each other nor have they all met at the same time. But by even offering a possible alternative to the U.S.-led system, this axis is already putting more pressure on the U.S. to back its allies, like Taiwan, South Korea, Israel, and most urgently, Ukraine, which this axis would like to see defeated. All of these countries would like to see Russia win in Ukraine because then Russia has demonstrated to the rest of the world that might makes right, that you can change borders through the use of force, and the United States power, the power of its allies, can be defeated, it can be overcome. And that the four of these states have figured out how to do it. So why not join them? All right, that's our episode for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. We hit 500,000 subscribers last week. Interesting. I think there's a lot more nuance, but maybe I think this is one of those topics that like it's it's kind of it's always going to be oversimplified because there's a lot of historical background that makes it almost impossible to jam it all into like even a, a fucking ten hour video. But that's how I feel about it. I don't know.